What you were looking at there was the output of this uh, TDA7492 based uh, Class D amplifier board which goes under the glamorous name of SKU145225 on Banggood.com and this particular board seems to be more of a case study in out of band distortion than an actual audio amplifier because uh, either the components the Chinese have used to build this device have been so far out of spec that the design has simply failed or what I find to be more likely or perhaps it might be a combination of the two factors is that they simply have failed to produce an adequate low-pass filter on the 8-bit of this device. Anyone who's familiar with how Class D amplifiers work uh, will know that uh, they work by digitally chopping up the signal you feed into them and 8-bitting it uh, uh, as a digital signal through an analog uh, low-pass filter in order to reproduce the, the initial signal uh, while allowing to use uh, binary drivers which only turn on and off in order to minimize linear loss in the transistors which works great if they're done properly but in this case they have not adhered to the design guidelines outlined in the datasheet for the actual uh, TDA7492 chip which calls for 22 nanohenry inductors which they have used but they call for one microfarad capacitors which they have not used and indeed as you saw the output of the two channels are vastly different and I believe that uh, at least one of the filters for this channel have actually failed so we're going to have to have a look at that and then once we've and then once we've fixed the obvious issues which uh, frankly render this device barely useful uh, we might actually make an attempt at reviewing this as an audio amp. So what liberties have the designers taken with this board then? Well, a good thing I've noticed is uh, they've actually gone with uh, an extra decoupling capacitor here right by the supply rail where it only calls for one, they've used two which is always a good thing. They have left uh, this uh, the low pass filter here intact made out of these two components there they have used 22 micro henry coils uh, instead of uh, 38 which is uh, fine uh, they re the data sheet recommends 22 micro henry for 6 ohms and 33 for 8 ohms so that's all in specification however on the 8 side of the uh, choke they have chosen to use the 100 nanofarad capacitor, which is this one, this one, instead of the 220 minimum recommended. For a 4 ohm load, this would be 470, and for a 6 ohm, it would be 220, but they've gone for 100, and instead they've added this little weird filter here on the 8 side, which is these components here, which are just uh, a 8.2 ohm resistor and some unknown capacitor going down to ground. I'm not certain what these are supposed to do. They, they look more like an EMI thing than uh, a low pass filter thing since they're going down to ground rather than between the outputs. Either way, I'm almost willing to bet that if we increase this capacitor to its intended size, this amplifier is going to perform uh, way closer to specification than, than, than it is right now because. What is on that scope? That's just inexcusable. And just for reference, prior to touching anything, here's one of the no signal uh, input charted output uh, of the amplifier looks. And uh, we've got 540 millivolts of noise at the 300 kilohertz, which is obviously the switching frequency of the amplifier. And uh, this is not something you're going to hear, but uh, this is going to transfer into sheet being produced in the amplifier since this uh, is a voltage being pushed through your speakers and uh, it's just going to be a general detriment to the performance of the device. In fact, the, the amount of noise uh, present in this 8 bit signal is uh, light, high enough to actually upset the test results I've been able to take with my distortion meter thus far and not even the cheap lead pipe was able to do that, so that speaks to the magnitude of this issue. 
I can hear it with the other channel where the noise is still quite high at 180 millivolts peak to peak, but with an RMS value of 57 millivolts, it's nowhere near as big of an issue as on the malfunctioning channel. So we've clearly got a quality control issue here where one channel is performing significantly worse than the other. And there we go, after a bit of TLC, we've managed to get the output uh, noise voltage down to thir about 32 millivolts RMS per channel. This is true for both sides. So, the issue has been resolved. And what I did in order to achieve that was to just uh, replace the dodgy original filter components with uh, new ones from, from my parts bin which have been ordered from proper name manufacturers. However, I don't think that's what's caused the original issue. Because, as you may be able to see, the soldering quality I've managed here isn't uh, quite uh, the best thing in the world. And I noticed that th these components were hand soldered, as, uh, as opposed to all the other uh, through hole components which were indeed wave soldered. And uh, this board seems to be very, very uh, firmly difficult to solder. Because the vias, the through plating in the actual holes for the through hole components, seem to be very limited in the heat carrying capability. So soldering this onto this top plane, where indeed the output trace is, uh, is uh, almost impossible. I had to solder this from the upside, and that goes for all the filter components. So what I believe happened was that just one of these components hadn't been properly soldered onto the actual top layer of a board. In a way, with that out of the way, we can finally get on to actually doing some proper audio measurement on this amplifier. Now, if this were to be true to the reviewing spirit, I would actually put the original filter components back. But, since the uh, noise voltage on the functioning channel was still a bit higher than I would really like to see, and the new ones, uh, which are just uh, box standard components, uh, produced somewhat better results, uh, I'm going to cheat a bit and leave these in there. Uh, the difference is uh, probably going to be a slight bit of roll-off in the high frequency, perhaps, and you're obviously going to see a lot less uh, out-of-bound noise in the, cha in the signal, but the general performance as far as uh, THD and so forth, and the noise floor, the audible noise floor, is concerned, everything should be just the same. So, I would say that uh, these uh, benchmarks are going to be a reasonable uh, idea of the performance of this amplifier, although I would probably recommend at least replacing uh, these uh, two filter capacitors with uh, either 220 or 470 nanofarad units, since the 100 nanofarads which uh, this one came fitted with are not suitable for the job. Yeah, the soldering quality definitely is a bit of an issue on this thing. After just a couple of reinstalls, the connection blocks for the paint supply are, have just fallen off entirely loose in the solder joints. Okay, so let's do some performance checking on this thing. Uh, one thing to note, this thing started making a buzzing noise. I'm not entirely certain what that means, but it seems to be performing a bit as well as it always has. Anyway, we've got the amplifier module connected to a switchable 8 or 4 test load here and we're probing one of the channels and we're pairing it uh, at 26 volts uh, buffered by t these two batteries here and powered by my EX752 power supply there. The 26 volts is the absolute maximum continuous uh, voltage rating for sampling if I can do uh, and I'm just abusing that to use to well, that's it, batteries in order to buffer the output uh, uh, capability of the power supply bit since it can only supply 4 amps of current. Anyway, the output of the amplifier is then connected to the HP 339A distortion meter and my Bryman BM869 there, which are going to give us our test results. So, let's get going. We're going to start off by measuring the noise floor of the amplifier and then we're going to measure the power at uh, 
0.1% distortion, the power at 1% distortion, i.e. the clipping power, the maximum power it can cleanly supply. Then we're going to check the damping factor of it, which is the output impedance, and the f do a rough fr frequency response test. And right now we are measuring the noise output. Uh, uh, we are at uh, a minus uh, 60 dBV scale, which is uh, 1 millivolt uh, full scale. And we're measuring uh, about minus 64 decibel volts of noise, or 600 microvolts, which is uh, quite poor, actually. Uh, it's about on par with a Li-Pi, uh, but uh, that, that's not saying much. So I'm not really pleased with that at all. Uh, but that's a relatively noisy amplifier. Moving on, let's uh, check the output power it can perform uh, at 0.1% distortion. We are at 0.3% uh, distortion full scale, which is uh, this scale down here. So let's see how high we can go. Right about there, I'd say. Yeah, giving any higher. Put it into very harsh clipping. So we're at 0.11% uh, distortion, which I'll go with as 0.1 and at 12.65 volts into 8 ohms, which uh, translates to 20 watts. That's not too impressive at all. Not too impressive. Moving on to the hard clipping performance, uh, let's see how high we can go. We are at the 3 volt, 3% uh, distortion full scale range. So let's see where we'll end up. Uh, that's just about 1%. That's 16.7 volts, which is uh, right about 35 watts per channel, which is just about what you would expect to get out of one of these amplifiers since the peak output voltage is uh, right about 23 point something volts. Moving on to the damping factor test at about half power, we've left the amplifier set at about 10 volts of output, which is uh, about 13 watts or so. And we'll do a relative measurement there and turn off the load, and we get uh, 0.288 volts of drop, which translates to an output impedance of 0.24 ohms, or a damping factor into 8 ohms of 34 which is, again, quite poor. And we'll do a crude frequency response test. Uh, we're starting out uh, at about uh, half power again, 10 volts, uh, uh, relative measuring the input level on the meter. We're set to minus 2 dB as so a starting point to give us some room upwards, some room downwards. And we'll start, this is 1 kilohertz. We'll start off at 10 hertz. We are down 1.2 decibels at 10 hertz, 0.4 decibels at 20, and at 30 decibels we're flat. 0 dB at 100, 0 dB at 1K, which you would expect, 2K flat, 3K flat, 4K flat, the amplifier is screaming at me. 5k flat, 6k flat, 7k flat, oh, 7k we're actually about 0.2 dB up, 8k, 0.2 dB up, 9k, 0.3 dB up, 10k, 0.4 dB up, 11k, 0.4, 12.6, 13.6, 15, 7, 16.7, 16.7, 17.7, 18.6, 19.6, 20k.6, 21k.4, 22k.1, 23k, we're at uh, about point. Oh dear. It, it's turning off, it's turning off. I think it might be over here. Yeah, it, it's the amplifier module. 
re-amplify module is overheating it went into a tick mode as you can see on the meter and this heat sink is burning hot to the touch ouch that's very very nasty this i'd say the heat sink is about 70 degrees or so no not 70 but uh, 50 up here so the chips are going to be quite hot in there so uh, this uh, yeah this heat sink is about a bit undersized for continuous uh, Rated power output at 26 volts. Anyway, if the amplifier cooled down, it seems to be working normally, so that's a thumbs up for the thermal protection, anyhow. And for the gain test, what I've done is I've adjusted the internal oscillator of the distortion meter to be at uh, 0 dB uh, at the minus at uh, this scale. So we'll just uh, flick over to measure the output voltage of the amplifier and we'll and we'll flick the range switch which goes in 10 dB steps so now we're at 10 dB gain 20 30 and 40 dB gain full scale and we subtract 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 point 2, 4, 6 so we've got a 33.4 dB of gain, which means that the TDA 7492 is set to its maximum gain setting, which might account for the quite high noise level. And just in case anyone was curious to use this thing as a car amplifier, the maximum output voltage at 14 volts into 4 ohms is uh, just of 8 volts or mm, just about 17 watts like every other amplifier ever. This is no better than your standard car stereo. And here's the distortion waveform at clipping which is actually quite clean. There's a bit of high frequency noise going on there, a bit of ringing pre-clipping but there's really nothing too horrible going on. Now we can see the pure distortion waveform where we've got uh, some high frequency stuff going on there quite a lot going on there but uh, the main clipping waveform is uh, pr pretty good just it behaves pretty much like a normal class AB amplifier but the distortion waveform when you just have a brink of clipping this is measured at about 1% uh, it does do the same thing as the Lipi does pushing out quite a lot of high frequency rubbish into your load. Now this actually cleans up once you get to further into clipping territory and you actually slam into the ra rail. So that, that seems to be something to expect out of a class D amplifier. So where does that leave us in the end? Well, to be brutally honest it leaves us with a really unremarkable cheap amplifier that I honestly can't really recommend to anyone for any purpose. The noise floor is mediocre but uh, that could probably be improved upon by decreasing the gain which is relatively easy to do with this uh, amplifier chip. The power before it starts to clip is really rather poor, I would expect more than 20 watts. In fact it should be closer to 30 at a 26 volt uh, power supply so that's really I should have written poor of that to be honest. And the clipping power at 1% is just about what you'd expect. It's voltage limited by the 26 volt power supply. The damping factor, quite poor compared to a hi fi amplifier. Most are around 100 and up, but for one of these cheapo chip amps, it's pretty okay. But in the grand scheme of things, it's a poor. Frequency response actually pretty good, 10 Hz to 23 kilohertz, uh, staying within a the decibel. There's no low frequency roll off to really think about. So this thing will probably do a good job pairing a small subwoofer, something like that. Of course, it's ma already made up of uh, two bridge tied channels, so you cannot bridge it to get uh, four times the power, but you can run stereo subwoofers on it, which uh, might be just as good depending on your application. The gain, 33.4 dB, insanely high, accounts for the noise floor probably, temperature protection, yes, present, working, but that's probably the only remarkably good point, 
I wouldn't expect that to trip with a heat sink this large. So the overall rating on this thing is resounding meh. Can't recommend it. I mean, 9.35. Build quality is abhorrent. It falls apart when you touch it. You need to modify it in order to work properly. Mine was broken out of the box and could have probably damaged speakers if it had been any worse off. So, yeah, make of that what you will. I would not recommend this product. Thank you for watching. Cheerio.